Hey, good morning. I hope everybody had a good weekend and a good Labor Day. Uh, today is the 5th of September. It's about 9, 10 in the morning, and I'm going ahead and doing our early Virginia lecture in hopes that you'll watch it. And uh, it's just going to be a real quick rundown of what's happening in the early part of European and British colonization. And before the 1580s, England's interest in the New World was really only about extracting wealth. Uh, they had no plans on setting up a permanent settlement, but that's going to change in 1584 when this guy, Sir Walter Raleigh, is basically going to go to the Queen of England, who at the time was Elizabeth I, and say, hey, I have a way to make you money. And the Queen is going to okay this, and Sir Walter Raleigh is going to put together an expedition that's going to explore the coast of what is today North Carolina, and they come to an island that's later known as Roanoke. And Sir Walter Raleigh and his team decide that Roanoke Island, it's fertile enough, it's big enough, and this is where we are going to put a colony. So in 1587, there's about 120 settlers who are going to go from England to Roanoke Colony. Uh, this is actually not going to be the first time. It's going to be the third time, actually, that they try to settle there but this is the best known. Uh, so we get about 120 settlers. They're going to settle the Roanoke Island. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh is going to be the leader. He's the financer, and he hires a guy named John White to actually do the boots on the ground leading. Well, about a month after they arrive, John White's going to go back to England to get more supplies, but while he's gone, a war is going to break out, and things are just going to go south when, when he gets back. During the time that he's gone, it's about a two and a half to three year span where the island is all by itself, the colony completely disappears and nobody actually knows what happens. Although now we've got a little bit of an idea with um, archaeology and just guessing and putting things together, uh, there were a couple of theories. One theory is that the people left the colony Another one is that the colonists were killed, and um, we now think that they were that they moved. Uh, there was an island south of Roanoke that was known as the Croatan. There were people on the island who were known as the Croatans, and on a fence post outside of the remains of the Roanoke village was the word Croatan. So now we think that the people of the Roanoke colony, at least some of them, moved south to be with the Croatan uh, native group. Uh, additionally, as research has been done where the Croatans lived, they have found that there were round post holes and square post holes. And that lets you know that there were two different types of people living there. Also, there are legends of people living amongst the Croatans who were blonde haired and blue eyed, which would play along with the idea of the Roanoke colony being there. Uh, finally, archaeology has found that their way of life changed about the time the Roanoke colony disappeared. And our guesses are the people of the Roanoke colony influenced the way the Croatans lived. But we may never know the actual truth. All right. If anybody's interested in watching this Roanoke colony video, just send me an email. I'll send you out this just like I've promised on the other ones. But we'll skip it, of course, because it doesn't make any sense to watch uh, here. The English, they don't give up. In 1606, King James I is going to start a new colony. He basically is going to give permission for a new colony to be begun. And this is going to be what's known as a joint stock colony. Uh, really what's going to happen is the king's going to take a bunch of people's money and put them into shares of a company and the king says okay if we profit we're all going to profit together if we don't profit then i'm just going to take your money so what were the investors promised they were promised gold and citrus and olive oil and a way to get to china that was going to be quicker than sailing around africa so 1607, three ships are going to be put together with about 100 men, and those 100 men are going to sail across the ocean to what is today the Chesapeake Bay. They're going to find a river that today is known as the James River, and they're going to sail about 40 to 50 miles north 
in the James River, and so they come to a place that they name Jamestown. I'm sure you can tell who all that was named after. Once they find a suitable place and name it Jamestown, they're going to set up shop there. They're going to build a, you know, a settlement. And the settlement's going to consist of houses so they can live in them, a storehouse so that they can keep all the stuff they're going to find, and a fort to protect their stuff, and then a church because glory be to God is how they would have viewed it. The problem is that all the people who settled in Jamestown, they were considered gentlemen, meaning they didn't work or didn't want to work or even didn't know how to work. Therefore, nobody was willing to get their hands dirty. Nobody was willing to farm. Uh, they thought they were there just to make money and profit. They didn't actually want to do any work. So the Jamestown colony is going to get off to a rocky start once the people realize that it's not just going to be um, you know, all sunshine and ponies. John Smith is going to be the leader. Uh, John Smith is better known uh, about the Pocahontas story, but in reality, he's going to become friends with a local group of natives led by a guy named Powhatan. Uh, Powhatan had previous experience with Europeans, and he knew what Europeans did and didn't do and what they could do for him. And Powhatan is believing that the English could help him against some of the enemies that he had. So Powhatan and John Smith are going to strike up a friendship. John Smith is going to become friends with Pocahontas. And um, John Smith and Powhatan will bargain with each other for supplies and do what they can. Uh, John Smith is also going to put a really strict rule down. Basically, if you don't work, you don't eat. John Smith, because he was a military man, people listened to him, and everything seemed okay until 1609. Um, some gunpowder prematurely exploded on John Smith or in John Smith's face, and he got burns all over his face, and he had to go back to England for medical treatment. And even though John Smith vowed to return, he never actually does. Um, so what happens when he's gone? It's called the starving time, and that should tell you how good things are. Uh, the winter of 19, I'm sorry, 1609 going into 1610, uh, it's it's not good. The idea of no no work, no food goes out the window. People stop doing what they're supposed to do. Starvation. There's even cannibalism, and everything is eaten. All the food, all the poultry, all the livestock, all the horses, you name it. And then people were going to be eaten as well. There are eyewitness accounts. I'm just going to read these to you real quick. Um, one eyewitness account says um, they were forced to eat dogs, cats, rats, and mice, and even corpses dug up from graves. And another survivor says one member of our colony murdered his native wife, ripped the child out of her womb, and threw it into the river, and then after chopping the mother in pieces, salted her for his food. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what starving time was like and what they did. Well, in 1610, a new governor is going to get to Virginia. His name is Thomas Gates. He's completely freaked out about what he sees, and he's going to put down some laws that are really, really um, harsh. One, some of the laws are going to make the colonists force the native people into working and being basically slaves. Others are going to focus on particular things happening within the colony itself, and a lot of the penalties are going to be death. Now, you do have to read some of these laws for this week, so I won't go into them too much, but I do have two of them written here. Uh, one says, No man shall use any traitorous words against her, his or her majesty's person or royal authority upon pain of death. So if you speak out against the monarch, you're going to be put to death. Another one says that no man speak impiously or maliciously against the holy and blessed trinity or any of the three persons. That is to say, against God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost or against known articles of the Christian faith upon pain of death. In other words, if you don't do what the church says or if you speak poorly about the church, they're going to kill you. So, yeah, death was going to be a way that order is restored within Virginia. Virginia is actually going to survive. And after Thomas Gates gets there and 
puts these new rules into place, uh, it's going to prosper. And by 1616, it's wealthy. Tobacco is going to be the primary crop that's being grown. And by 1618, the Virginia Company is going to change one of its policies and it's going to adopt something called the headright policy. Now, the headright policy is going to develop into indentured servitude. Basically, uh, the way this works is if you could pay for your own way over, they would give you 50 acres. So you have a lot of money, you pay your own way over to Virginia, you get 50 acres for free. But for anybody who you brought with you and you paid their way as well, you got their 50 acres too. So if you're really wealthy and you pay for four people to come over, you suddenly have 200 acres just waiting for you in Virginia. Now what about the people that you paid for? They become your servant because they have to pay off the money that they owe you. So the servant is going to be an indentured worker who is paying off a debt they owe to you. And the average contract could be three to seven years, but they could go much longer than that. And that's because anytime you stop working, that stoppage time is going to be added to the end of the contract. I don't know if any of you are familiar with rules of soccer, but if there's any stoppage time in soccer, the extra time is added to the end of the game or the end of the half. It's kind of that same thing. Uh, so if you break an arm, if you break a leg, if you get sick, maybe you're pregnant with a child and you can't work, any of that stoppage time is added to the end of the contract. So three to seven years could balloon very quickly. This idea of indentured servitude is the way most labor was done in Virginia all the way up until 1675. Three out of every four workers in Virginia were indentured servants up until 1675. Uh, one other note is that the Virginia Company is going to be dissolved in the year 1624 and Virginia is going to be put directly under royal control, which means only the king or queen, if there was one, could tell the people of Virginia what to do. In the Chesapeake Bay colonies, which include Maryland, Virginia, and the very northern part of North Carolina, um, those places are going to develop very similarly. Uh, some of the wealthiest and richest families are going to settle there. Uh, their families are very important in American history. I've got some of them listed here. The Harrisons produced presidents. The Lees produced presidents, just not under the Lee name. The Randolphs produced presidents, just not under the Randolph name. And the Taylors are going to produce presidents as well. Uh, so a lot of wealthy people are going to come over to these Chesapeake Bay colonies and Virginia. For the political system, Virginia is going to set up a representative system that has two houses. This is known as a bicameral legislation. And they're going to have the House of Burgesses and they're going to have the Governor's Council. Both of those are going to help the royal governor set laws and most importantly raise taxes. A lot of the government's going to be done on the local level, so the county court's going to be where the trials are done, they're going to be the ones where the taxes are paid and raised, they're going to be doing the militia service, they're going to be building the roads, and so this idea of, of local government starts very early in the American colonies, which surprises a lot of people. Uh, the idea of personal governance and local governance starts all the way at the beginning. Now you might want to know about the Church of England. Yes, it is in America, and it still is today. It has a political presence, but not anything like it did over in Europe. Um, most people really don't have a lot to do with the church because they're so busy working and they're so spread out. There aren't very many ministers, and so if a minister comes to be at your church that week, you're expected to go, but that may only happen every couple of weeks. So daily life, uh, it's boring really it's lonely uh, the farms are very spread out it takes a, a while to get to know your neighbors the only time you really come together are things like church and court uh, tobacco is what you're going to be growing uh, very few people grow food you basically are just growing enough food to get by and the rest of your land is going to be used for tobacco because tobacco is where the money is made there are also not very many women um, Women can kind of bargain because 
women are so few and far between, they hold economic power and economic status. So if you're a woman and you got three people who want to marry you, uh, you can hold out and you can take the best deal or you can negotiate. Even if you do get married, if your husband died, which was pretty common, you could still negotiate a second marriage as well. Uh, slavery will enter Virginia around 1640, but it doesn't become the dominant labor force until we get to 1675. But slavery is a thing as early as the 1640s, and it continually is going to grow. What makes it grow? Um, there's a rebellion in 1676 led by a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. There's a lot of stuff on the slide. You can read it yourself, but I'm just going to kind of summarize what's going on. Nathaniel Bacon is a friend, or maybe even a relative to William Berkeley, who was the governor of Virginia, and he basically thought he should be on part of the in crowd, and he wasn't. So what he's going to do, uh, Berkeley is going to pursue this friendly Native American policy and try to get the people of Virginia to live side by side with Native Americans. But a lot of people who used to be indentured servants, the land that they're living on given is out on the frontier. And so there's a struggle between these former indentured servants who have been released from their contracts and the Native American people. Well, Nathaniel Bacon is going to encourage and even foment or create a war between the Native Americans and the English settlers. And before you know it, Bacon is going to be the leader of this mob because he's the one who is going to lead the, the battles against the Native Americans. Bacon and his legion of followers is going to turn on William Berkeley, chase him out of the capital, burn down the city of Jamestown, and um, you know, it really looks like there's going to be a big change. However, Bacon dies the rebellion kind of peters out and Berkeley comes back to Jamestown and the idea of indentured servitude is going to become unwelcome just because those who were formerly indentured servants they want rights and they're willing to fight for them so they have to change the whole system indentured servitude falls out of favor and African slavery is going to be its replacement Once again, here's a f video that you could watch if you wanted to, and if you're interested in watching it, just send me an email. I'll send you the link or I'll send you the file. Uh, last but not least, I just want to briefly talk about the Carolinas. In 1663, or in, in the uh, early 1660s, I should say, the monarchy in England is reestablished. There's about a 10 to 12 year period where there is no monarch in England. There's no king. King Charles I, his head is separated from his shoulders. Some bad stuff happens, and then in the early 1660s, the English Parliament is going to invite a new king to come. Well, King Charles II is that new king, and as a thank you for to the people who helped him get the throne, he's going to give them land in the New World, and this becomes the Carolina Colony. Uh, the Carolina colony is going to grow up very differently. Northern part of Carolina colony is going to be in former indentured servants with these small farms. Southern Carolina colony is going to be these large plantations and they're going to have lots of slavery. And these two colonies just grow further and further and further apart until 1712 when the eight Lord proprietors of the Carolina colony decide to split the colony into two different parts. And that's where we get North Carolina and South Carolina fun. North Carolina is going to continue with these small independent farms, but South Carolina is going to continue to grow bigger and bigger with slavery. And South Carolina is going to be very closely related to the British West Indies and become part of that slave trade and that sugar trade. All right, um, real quick, I mean, it's 20 minutes or less. Um, let me know if you watch this, and if you have any questions about anything, just send me an email. Thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.